Happy Sabbath, church. All right, we're going to get right into this. We have a lot to cover, and I um, want to get through it. I want to thank everyone for coming out in the rain, um, and um, we'll just get into God's Word. Our scripture reading was taken from Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse 14. Revelation 17, 14 says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Our message in our last day event series, this is the 11th part, is Israel and the last war. Israel and the last war. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. I ask now, Lord, that once again, that you just make me a nail on the wall, hang a portrait upon that nail of Jesus Christ. Let me not be seen or heard today. Lord, as these heavy issues are discussed, I ask for an extra outpouring of your Holy Spirit, not just for me, but for those who would hear this message as well. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll start. It's been a little while since I've, I've given uh, one of the ep- um installations in the series. So we're going to start with some end time updates. And one of the things, Pastor Tom, if you guys miss prayer meeting, you, you really miss a lot. Uh, I have to keep saying that. And we had a really good discussion, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday before about what's happening in the Middle East. And one of the things Pastor Tom pointed out was that if you look um, specifically, um, the Muslim world has been having a lot of things happen. Um, we talked earlier about the Libyan flood. I think I mentioned that in a previous message. Um, and in this flood, 11,000 people died. A dam broke and washed away 11,000 people. Um, some argue it was preventable. I'm, I, don't, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't know. I'm definitely not an engineer to figure out what happened. But um, this was a, a major catastrophe. We know that then there was an earthquake in Morocco. And in Morocco, in this earthquake, 3,000 died. And I want you to think about the the, the number of people in each of these episodes. I want you to understand where we are in the stream of time, that this can happen. We think about it sometimes for but a glancing moment, and we move on to the next issue. 3,000 people died, and probably many of us forget, forget that there was even an earthquake in Morocco, right? Earlier in the year, Turkey and Syria had an earthquake. The death toll there surpassed 50,000 people, 50,000 people. Um, I talk about, on uh, for those of you from the former British colonies, the Boxing Day, in, I think it was in 2003, when there was a tsunami, that a quarter of a million people died, a quarter of a million people. And we're going to see that this is what was prophesied. But when we move now, we know that there is a late and, a, and another thing affecting that region of the world, probably in many ways the most significant. When it's natural disasters, storms, floods, earthquakes, you can kind of say, you know, that's, that's just bad luck. I, I, I don't believe that. I believe something's happening in the world. I believe that the Spirit of God is being removed from this planet. I believe that Satan is now able to do things in ways he couldn't before. And I want to submit to you that if you are not rooted and grounded in the word of God, as these things increase in uh, frequency, people's faith will decrease proportionally. People will begin to blame God for what's happening because they don't understand what is actually happening. Man is rejecting God, rejecting his salvation. And God is not someone who forces himself upon anyone. So as man, collectively, the planet, rejects God, God begins to withdraw. He moves back. And as he moves back, the devil gets more power and more of these things are going to happen. I shouldn't say the devil gets more power. The devil gets more, uh, more of an ability to do these things. But there are also road signs for us. Road signs because if we're not careful, we would fall asleep at the wheel while all of this is happening. We could easily be intoxicated with social media. 
so worried about how many likes we have and how many how many people um click on our our post and 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 worried about what other people are posting we can be so intoxicated with what is next to binge on netflix so caught up in the latest uh, um um kelsey swift um nfl dating saga folk some folk ain't never watched a game of football watching football now because taylor swift shows up to the game caught up in all of this stuff and by getting caught up in it you can be so distracted that even as god is allowing these road signs to appear you are fast asleep this happened before and i'm gonna go back to the verse i want you to know that when we deal with last day events kind of like the, the road map the, the the blueprint the background the outline is all in matthew chapter 24 and when Jesus was dealing with these issues in Matthew 24, when his disciples asked him, when would this be? Because he said that the temple would be destroyed. Yes, Jesus said the temple would be destroyed. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, when Jesus leaves the temple, he says, I leave your house unto you desolate. I want you to remember that when we get to later in the sermon, because there are people who think that there is some, um, some necessity for that temple to be rebuilt and for the feasts and the sacrifices to be reinstituted. I want you to remember that Jesus himself said that your temple, I leave your house unto you desolate. And then he says in Matthew chapter 24, just before the verses we're about to read, he says, when the disciples say, look, look at the beauty of the temple, those stones were massive. They were beautiful. The architecture, the craftsmanship was impressive. And Jesus' response was not one of someone who's impressed. Jesus said instead, not one of these stones will be left on top of another. This sent disciples into a tailspin. They wanted Jesus to be crowned king. And I want you to get, there's also a prophetic reoccurring theme of people wanting to build earthly kingdoms, empires, nations. There's this desire to fix this earth so they can stay here. And you see in that, in all of the demonstrations and all these things, people think that they can fix this planet. They have no idea who's actually in control. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Israeli, Palestinian, everybody's picking sides. I submit to you, if you think either is an enemy, you have missed the true teaching of Scripture. Your enemy is invisible in many ways. Uh, it is the enemy who was uh, an enemy of Christ in heaven. It is uh, Satan, Lucifer himself. And because we like to fight what we can see, we are often being destroyed by what we cannot see. Matthew 24 and verse 3 says this, and, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Now what's interesting about this is that Jesus now, and I'm going to show you it more a little later, he actually does a dual prophecy. Jesus begins to tell them what first is going to happen to Jerusalem, the place where they are, what's going to happen to the temple, what's going to happen to the believers, what's going to happen over the next 40 years. He, he in that one generation, he explains what's going to happen. But in doing so, he also explains what will happen today. Of all the prophets in Scripture, Christ is the greatest. And then he says in verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. I told you before, that word for deceive in the Greek is the word planeo. It means to be led away. He says, be careful. And I want to submit to you that we live today in an age of deception. And you saw it in this war. You saw it when there was this tragedy happened. And I don't know who, did, I, I would not speak to say who did what, because again, it's an age of deception. But a hospital was destroyed uh, in Gaza and many lives were lost. And each side said the other side did it. Now, here's where it gets deep. Each side then tried to, pro, to, to give you proof that the other side did it. You li we live in such an age of deception that you can't actually even trust what you see in video. Somebody was showing, I was, I was reading this thing on AI, and they were show, showing the, the potential. And, and there's actually a conversation that Bill Maher interviewed one of his guests on his show uh, a couple, like when, the, just after the Friday after everything happened in Israel. 
And this guy was saying that, in fact, we have to worry because the artificial intelligence is not going to grow in a curvilinear fashion as most intellect grows because the intellect of AI can actually be programmed to go back and improve AI itself. It actually will grow in a straight line up. This man is warning the world that artificial intelligence is one of the greatest threats to the world. And I said, listen, that sounds like the movie Terminator, right? And the guy said, and it was Bill Mars, and the guy said, yeah, that's literally what's happening. The day is coming when they, they, you won't be able to trust anything. When Jesus says, be careful that no man deceive you, I want you to understand you are in an age of deception because of social media, television, artificial intelligence. You are in an age of deception that literally when the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight, you had better have really good faith vision. Matthew 24 and verse 5 says this. For many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that happened. I, 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 I'll save that for another message. But this is where it gets interesting. This is where what's going on in the world now. You can just see it all outlined. And it's important because of what verse 8 says. So let's look at 6 and 7. It says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. What do war? And here's what the Bible says. Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we saw the, 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 the first world war, the second world war. Uh, for, as Americans, our bloodiest war was actually the Civil War. So all those wars happened from the mid-1800s all the way to the end of last century. All these wars happened, Iraq, Afghanistan, up until the present day. Jesus points out that the thing that you, the one thing that is not instrumental to his second coming is wars. I hope you're not missing this. In other words, while some Christians, as we're going to talk about, are jumping up and down in glee that there's a war in the Middle East because they think it's going to lead to the end of the world, I want to submit to you, if you're looking to a war as the key to the end of the world, you are looking in the wrong direction. You are being deceived. Why? Jesus says, human nature is going to play out for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. I've talk, talked about this before. The word for nation in the Greek is the word ethnos, stands for ethnicity. Jesus predicts that there will be racial, ethnic tension in the world. And we have seen in America a devolution of racial relations in this country. Black and white people in America actually got along better in the 70s and 80s than they do now philosophically. We're watching the opposite of what you would think happened after the civil rights laws were passed in the 60s. And it's not just us. There are parts of Eastern Europe. There are parts of Africa, parts of the world where in some cases, people, you can't even tell the two groups of people apart, but they're ethnically different and they're fighting. Jesus prophesied that that would happen. It talks about the famines, the pestilences, which is like COVID, and we have other diseases we're worried about. I was just on a infectious disease talk this week let me tell you something there's some scary stuff out there that they're worried about earthquakes and diverse places we talked about but where it gets interesting is verse 8 it says all of these are what they're just the beginning of sorrows why i mean when you read that you, you almost quake if you really are a student of scripture how is it that all that we see including this war now including covid including the famine and the hunger in the world all that we see and when jesus is prophesying about it he comes to this summation in verse 8 he says this is just the beginning of sorrows here's the thing so if you can't withstand the sorrow of today how are you going to stand in what's coming Jeremiah said, if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to keep up with the horses? All right, so here's what Jesus says. Why is it going to get worse? Matthew 24, 9 and 10 tells you. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. What is going to happen because of everything in verses 6 and 7, what verse 8 pivots and tells us is somewhere along the line, the entire world is going to turn on the true believers of God. I want you to see the emotions, the animation, the, the passion around uh, causes today, uh, social justice causes, what's going on in the Middle East. I want you to see the fire, the, the, the fervor that people have. And I want you to understand that one day, if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, that passion will be directed against you. 
That's why what you see now is just the beginning of sorrows for Christians. And I don't say this to scare you, but I hope what I'm, what I'm saying helps you to understand that this is not a time to be playing with God. And then we get to the verse that I want to get to for our message today, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. Jesus says this, and many false prophets shall rise and shall do what? Shall deceive many. Connected, don't miss this, to the persecution of the believers is the rise of a system of false prophets. Right? Many false prophets. They're going to rise and deceive many. There's something about this statement that is critical for last day events to be understood and connected to what's going on in Israel right now. I w- we will draw a line to show that, in fact, there is great deception happening. And if you're, if you're not uh, connected to Scripture and connected to God, right now you are putting yourself at risk. So who are the false prophets? Well, uh, what did they say then and what do they say now? Jesus was referring to something. There's, every time you, you read the New Testament, you can almost find something in the Old Testament that helps in illuminate that statement. And how will we know truth from error, right? So Matthew 7, Jesus, let's look, look at where else Jesus talks about false prophets. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their what? They're fruits. The Bible talks about the fruit of the spirit. The false prophets will also have fruit. They will produce something that tells you who they are. One of those things is false doctrine. One of them is immorality in life, in their own lives. And another one of them is they will promote immorality and call it righteousness. So you will know them by their fruits. Matthew 7, 21, same chapter, a little further down says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus gives us the litmus test. It's not that people call themselves Christians. Calling yourself a Christian is a nice thing to do. The Bible says that even the demons believe and they tremble. So calling yourself a Christian is not enough. And there are a lot of folk who think that calling yourself a Christian is enough. He says, no, in fact, he goes in and he says, um, wh- wh- who is righteous, who's worthy? He that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. This is something that a lot of people don't want to hear. Obedience is the fruit. And obedience can only come from a transformed character. And the character can only be transformed when it has been submitted to the Holy Spirit. Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. These will be people who have produced Christian works you, that you will think that they're amazing. They would, they would have preached to tens of thousands. They, they would have stood before the masses. They would have worked great miracles. But Jesus says, I then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because it's not the outward showing that makes a Christian. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the transformation of the heart, so that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Which leads to obedience, because here's the thing, the devils can work miracles. Revelation 16, speaking of the false prophets again. Revelation 16, 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So here we can draw the line. There was a statement about false prophets in Matthew 24 that Jesus makes. And now you draw the line to Revelation. And it says that in the last days, again, there's going to be false prophets. And these false prophets will come out. uh, This false prophet will be tied to the dragon and the beast. And we remember who the dragon is. The dragon is Satan. The beast is the papal system. And the false prophet is apostate Protestantism. Watch this. Verse 14. For they are the spirit of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kingdoms of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. People think that the last great war, or or they think, you know, this is some great religious war that's happening in the Middle East now. I want to submit to you that most people are totally confused. The real war, the real last war of Israel, I'm going to show you who Israel is from a theological spiritual perspective is that in front of us and let me say this the real war is not the war that will be happen with tanks 
and rockets and grenades and machine guns. It is the war for hearts and minds. The great controversy, as, 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 as cosmic and, 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 and seemingly infinite as it is, is actually, most importantly, worked out in us. The war is going on for your heart and your mind. Every time we turn on the television, listen to the radio, everything we do, a battle is happening. And so because sometimes we think that it's, you know, it's, it's the clanging of swords that make for a war, we miss that the, the enemy can lull you to sleep. In fact, Jesus ties this to the idea of this last day false prophet. He says this in Revelation 16 and verse 15. He says this, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He talks about the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. He talks about, uh, this is John the Revelator writing, um, Jesus speaking. He talks about these three unclean spirits like frogs that go out and spiritualism undergirds all of it. Won't hit that too much today. When Jesus talks about this and how, these, how they will go out, uh, to gather them to battle for the great day of God Almighty, Jesus pauses his discussion to bring in the second coming. He says, behold, in other words, pay attention. I come as a thief. How do thieves come? Do thieves come blowing their horn and flashing their headlights? Do they come yelling and screaming outside of your house? Hey, hey, I'm here to rob you. I grew up in, where well, I lived in Miami. <laughs> in Miami, boy, it was, I had some grimy friends. And some of them, there were a lot of them were, were thieves. Now, prayerfully, I was too afraid of my mother to ever join in any of those activities. But they would come back and tell the, the, the exploits of going out and, and, rob, and robbing people's rims off their cars. They got a thrill out of that one. Somebody put real nice rims on their car, they'd go and steal them. And they would go and steal them in the middle of the night. I mean, it was like work. They would like clock in and clock out. They'd have a list of what they were supposed to steal. And, uh, seriously. And I'll never forget, one of them times we were probably at school at lunch or something, they were talking about it, and they said they wrote on the windshield of someone's car, you sleep, we creep. The thief creeps when you sleep. Now, Jesus isn't coming as a thief because he's taking something that isn't his. But what he's warning us of is that if you're not careful, if your eyes aren't open, if you're not paying attention, he's not, you know, you're going to miss the whole thing. This is why he says, blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I want you to notice that righteousness by faith, which will be our next series, righteousness by faith is tied up in this prophecy. If you're not watching, if you're not paying attention, right, you will lose your garments, you'll walk naked, and they will see your shame. It's all tied together. Because what the world, the false prophets are going to tell you is that somehow you can save yourself, which is where Israel comes in. You see, what they're beginning to teach, and I'm going to give you more detail in a second, is that somehow if they can build this third temple, they can usher in the second coming of Jesus, and they can end the world. They missed the whole boat. Watch this. Revelation 19, 20 talks about what this false prophet would be able to do. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. What did the false prophet, what was he able to do? Work miracles. With which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with what? Brimstone. Now, the false prophet works miracles. This is why this is such an age of deception. And I've come to realize that some of these miracles are, are, may simply be cinematic. It may simply be what they put in movies. The movies where, you know, the one where the little boy went to heaven. You remember that one? Um, I forget the name of it because I, I couldn't watch it. Um, and the little boy goes to heaven. heaven uh, I forget what it is. Heaven is for real, I think it was called. And the little boy goes to heaven and meets and sees his grandfather and all this stuff. They make a movie out of it. Only to later on find out the, boy was, the little, little boy was, wasn't telling the truth the whole time. But through the movie, people begin to believe that you die and you're still alive. Miracles. One of the great <clears throat> uh, kind of diatribes in the scripture about false prophets is from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 
speaks about the false prophets. Now we're going to come back to today. Jeremiah 23, 9 says this. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets, the false prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. I want to submit to you. And I don't have time to get into it. But tied into this is sexual sin. Sexual sin is going to cause many to become false prophets. Because in order to justify immorality, they will have to prophesy contrary. They'll have to speak contrary to the word of God. Just what happened in Jeremiah's day. For because of swearing the land mourneth, the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. You see that? Yeah, yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. Look at what the the false prophets do. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hand of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They preach so that people's sins, that people are in their sins and they feel perfectly fine. They strengthen the hand of evildoers. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. I hope you're getting the the gravity of this because when you look at the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, from Ezekiel 16 and verse uh, 49, sorry, in verse 16, what it, what it actually says, that the sins of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, idleness, and they did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And then they committed abomination. This is the day in which we live, where anything goes now. I mean, common sense has gone out the window. 15, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink of water of gall, for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profane has gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. Uh, they make you a vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still, uh, they say still unto them that despise me that the Lord hath said ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come to you. They say to everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come to you. That is literally what is being preached from the pulpits of the world today. One of the, when I think about the imagination of your heart, you know what comes to mind? Disney. You know what Disney teaches? Follow your heart. That's an interesting statement. Follow your heart. You know, if you follow your heart, you usually get in trouble. I've talked here about the, the, the studies that show, you know, because it's all romantic love. The, the, the studies that show that when you think you're in love, your brain actually functions, behaves, and looks as if you were on cocaine. They put, pe- they put pictures of people, the person they think they're in love with, inside of the, the PET scan machines. And when they look, the part of the brain that lights up are the parts of the brain that, sh- that are like, like as if you're intoxicated. And the other part of it is parts of the brain, like the, in the frontal lobe, in the prefrontal cortex, that are responsible for judgment and reason are shut off. The amygdala, where fear comes from, is shut off. And so when they tell you, follow your heart, what they're telling you to do is to turn off reason. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because Isaiah 1 and verse 18 says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. What they tell you to follow your heart or to walk after the imagination of your heart, what they're telling you is don't use the part of your brain necessary for salvation. Because Isaiah 1 18 says, come, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So be careful. All these rom-coms and all this stuff, it's, it's a way for the devil to elevate romantic love above agape love or God's love. So that you think the highest form of love is romance. It is not. The highest form of love is God's love. In fact, the scripture says God is love. Jeremiah says, for who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? And hath perceived and heard his word. Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have returned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? God said, listen, if they had really been around me, Wouldn't they have called people out of sin? 
If they had really been around me, and TBN is about to have a program, a Trinity Broadcasting Network, an f- interesting program where they're actually going to have uh, um, uh, 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 like cross-dressing uh, Christian artists. If God was speaking, wouldn't it line up with the scripture? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said. The prophet, see, lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. And, and Jeremiah goes on, and he says, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Now, so Jeremiah is doing that. And it didn't come to pass at all what they said. So what they were lying and saying, let me just make it plain. These false prophets were saying as Nebuchadnezzar was coming for the the, the real last war in Israel happened during Nebuchadnezzar, during the days of Daniel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. What happened is the the people of God had fallen into sin, as we were just reading. And if you read the the, the minor prophets of the Old Testament, a lot of it is really just showing you what those sins are and how God is going to deal with them. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful um, um, scriptures on the redemption and how God is going to rebuild. What they did is they had false prophets, and one of my one of my favorite ones, um, I think his name was Hananiah. He came to Jeremiah and he was like, "Listen, you know, in two years, this, you know, the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar has to be broken." And they had Jeremiah wearing this wooden yoke, and he and he, you know, and he was like, "Broke it." And he said, "We're gonna break Nebuchadnezzar like we broke the yoke." Bragging. Jeremiah said, "No." The Lord has come back a little later on and says, the Lord has said the yoke will now be iron. Nebuchadnezzar is going to leave with iron. And Jeremiah said, whoever prophesies truth, he's the real prophet. And you know what he prophesied about the, the false prophet? That he would die within a year. And he did. And yet they still didn't listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's message to them was, stop fighting and just go to Nebuchadnezzar and you will live. And they refused because of the false prophets. They wouldn't listen because the false prophets kept telling them that because they were children of Israel, children of Abraham, there's no way God would allow this. He delivered us all those times before. He'll deliver us again. That's what the false prophets kept kept telling them. I want to submit to you that if you're not careful, the false prophets will tell you God loves you too much for anything bad to happen to you. He lost. I mean, there are people who believe God loves you too much for you to be eternally lost. But look at what ends up happening. Interesting Bible story. I'll read this quick and we'll jump back to this war now. 2 Kings 25. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the day of, the, of that of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. This was the last war Israel had before Israel was no more. Israel does not reappear on the world stage until 1948. How did Israel reappear? This is important if you want to understand the prophecy was happening. It was something called the Balfour Declaration that the British actually instituted. It was the British who took the Middle East and carved it up, just like they carved up Africa uh, and just like uh, other colonial powers carved up other parts of the world. It was carved up, and it was not carved up so that peace would be instituted. Many argue that. Instead, the Middle East was carved up so that British interests would always be served. I hope you're not missing what I'm telling you. It wasn't carved up so that the Palestinians, who didn't actually have a state then, uh, and the Jews, who had just come out of um, the, 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 the merciless, horrible experience of the, of the Second World War uh, and the Holocaust, so they had, you had, you, who wanted a homeland. And some people don't know, when I was in Israel, they, they were telling me that actually they were trying to send them, the British were trying to send the, the European Jews to Africa, to, I think it was to Uganda to live. Or Kenya. They were trying to send them to the... And they, they were, of course, they refused. They said, no, we want Israel back. We want our land back. And they cut a deal, and they did it. And as soon as the Israeli state was instituted, all of its neighbors attacked. And that was 19... You go back to 1948. There was a massive war. Israel won the war. And when they did, they took land. Now, what's important, and I'm not taking a side, but this is the historical fact, they didn't actually take land from a Palestinian state. They took land from, um, uh, I believe it was Jordan and Egypt. They had land in that area. They took that land and built a state in order to try and be protected. 
Now, the reason that's important is because certain of the British, and we'll talk about in a second, and many Americans were thrilled because they had adopted a theology that this state has to exist. In fact, many of them thought that this was going to usher in the end of the world. Now, this, I mean, this is how deep it gets. So, in 1844, there was a great disappointment among those who would become Seventh-day Adventists, the Millerite movement. It was 100 years later that the devil came up with a whole nother way to deceive. A hundred years later, after the horrors of the Second World War, this institution, uh, this, this system, I should say, of the Balfour Declaration was put into the Middle East, and it was almost, in my opinion, designed so that you would forever have controversy. There would always be war. It was designed that way. It's not a surprise that this war is breaking out. And there are, and there are plans, I believe, for something to come out of this thing. What we're watching happening does not have the kind of prophetic meaning they think, but I do believe it is a move towards solidifying a one-world governmental system and a one-world religious system. Because people are going to clamor for peace. You see it already. And in the clamoring for peace, people will, allow, will almost give up all their rights and allow for anything. Everybody is going to want the world to go back to normal, just like the pandemic. And if you, have you noticed that, you see how Satan is working? He's, he's really working hard. And we went from a pandemic, 2020, then we had George Floyd murdered, and we saw this polarizing of the world around race in the United States, inside the church, folk arguing over race then they came up with a vaccine folk arguing over a vaccine a vaccine and arguing over a vaccine and now look there's something else to split the world and to split the church and every time church folk are duped into thinking that these divisive moves of satan are what's actually important every time duped and the last time they had a great war this was it Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city. He came in. He, he, the city was broken up. All the men of war fled by night. The soldiers ran, right? God was no longer with them. The army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains. And look at verse 7. This is how terrible it is. Listening to the false prophets, this is what happened. It says, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah, he was king, before his eyes. So they, they took the king of Babylon. They, they, they killed his sons before his eyes. And then look what they did. They put out his eyes. Now, I want you to understand the cruelty of this. They took him, and remember, he's a king. His, 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 his progeny, his, his children, his sons especially, are what's most important to him. They let him watch them kill his sons, take out his eyes, so that's the last thing he would ever see. Bound him with fetters and brass and carried him to Babylon. And they took everything out of the house of the Lord. Literally, everything. That's why later on, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, is drinking out of the, the, the vessels of the house of the Lord when the meanie meanie Tikalu Farson comes up on the, here's where they stole it. So what is it that's really happening? One, they commit adultery. They walk in lies. They have stubborn hearts. They speak their mind and not the words of God. There are four things that Jeremiah points out in 23 that results in this massive destruction. That Jesus is referring us to for the last days. Matthew 24, 11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Uh, for there shall also arise false Christ and false prophets, this is later in Matthew 24, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would do what? Deceive the very elect. The false prophets in our day will be so apt at what they do that if it were possible, they could deceive the very elect. And listen to, because some people say that this, why do you preach this stuff? It's not important. Listen to the words of Jesus if you don't want to listen to my words. Look at verse 25. He says, behold, I have told you before. In other words, I'm warning you that this is what you're going to have to look at. Here's what Christ Object Lesson, page 32. We just actually read this in prayer meeting this Wednesday night. The sin of the world today is the sin that brought destruction upon Israel. In gratitude to God, the neglect of opportunities and blessings, the selfish appropriations of God's gifts, these were comprised in the sin that brought wrath upon Israel. They are bringing ruin upon the world today. The tears which Christ shed upon Olivet as he stood overlooking the chosen city were not for Jerusalem alone. In the fate of Jerusalem, he beheld what? The destruction of the world. I told you that prophecy was a dual prophecy. Jesus went up, and as he looked over Jerusalem, he wept. 
the two times scripture records Jesus weeping. One of them is over Jerusalem here. The other one is at Lazarus' tomb, death. Jesus came from heaven to save man. Can you imagine his agony as he looked at how trifling the people were, how unconcerned with their own salvation they were? As he stood at Lazarus' tomb and realized how many would die. Some people say, how could God be God if he doesn't care what's happening to all the people in the Middle East right now and all that's happening? You missed it. In the Bible, it tells us Jesus already cried over this. And this is what he says, Luke 19, 42. If thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. Israel failed. You see, and a lot, what a lot of the evangelicals do is they go back and they take the prophecies. The, the last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel has this beautiful third temple built that was never built because they didn't live up to the promises. They did not uh, hold up their part of the bargain. They failed God. In fact, one of the reasons there's so much talk in the book of, e uh, of Ezekiel uh, 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 and Jeremiah about coming out of Babylon at the end of the 70 years is that when the people of God got to Babylon, the Medo-Persians took over, they were living so comfortably. They didn't want to come back and rebuild Israel. So they stayed and then they didn't fulfill their part and that's why there's this cry, come out of Babylon, and that cry is the cry for us today. But today it's spiritual Babylon. Here's what she says, Christ object lesson. In this day, the day is nearing its close. The period of mercy and privilege is well nigh ended. The clouds of vengeance are gathering. The rejectors of God's grace are about to be involved in swift and irretrievable ruin. Yet, look at this, yet the world is asleep. The people know not the time of their visitation. The world is truly asleep. How do we know? Well, at the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we're talking about false prophets now, the apostate church. In fact, we don't even call ourselves Protestants in America anymore. They're evangelicals. And it's an interesting twist because one of the pre presidential candidates, um, uh, Mike Pence, the former vice president, he's an evangelical Catholic. So by removing the word Protestant and replacing with evangelical, you can now blend all of these things together. And here the Catholics and Lutherans mark 500th year anniversary of Reformation. In fact, they came out and said there is no more Re Reformation. It's ended. Has it really ended? When Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis both say that actually evolution is what's real and not Genesis 1 and 2, I, I will still want reform from that. And I could go on and on. Here's another one. Pope Francis meets with Kenneth Copeland, James Robinson. High fives ensues. And this is from Charisma. This is a, a, a Pentecostal a magazine. And these are uh, big uh, leaders in the Pentecostal and evangelical uh, movement. They have realigned with the Vatican. The false prophet. Remember, it was the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They will come together. And at the root of it will be spiritualism. Don't miss that. When you see these folk doing some of these Pentecostal things, I remember, um, um, you know, going to one of, the, one of these churches and they were, they were um, speaking in tongues. They made no sense. I knew it wasn't a real language. And folks started running in circles around the church. And one lady, she was like, one girl, she had to be like seven months pregnant. She was running like everybody else and ran straight into a pole in a beam in the church. Bam! Fell out. I was in college. I, jumped up. I was shocked. I said, poor girl, call an ambulance. They dragged it to the back. The drums started up again, and everybody started running around and got all over again. Let me tell you something. That's, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that that's the Holy Spirit working. But this is the move that's happening. This is the false prophets of today. They want something tangible. They want something they can touch and feel. They want to be in control of the Spirit rather than the Spirit being in control of them. This is the false prophecy of the day that promises you you can have whatever you want. You can follow your heart. Every imagination of your heart, you can have it. This is the, uh, the, 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 the these, uh, many of these churches now they teach a prosperity gospel. Just name it and claim it. I remember one girl, she started falling stuff. She was Adventist too. She started believing that stuff and watching some of these televangelists. And she said she's going to name it and claim it. And on January 2nd or 3rd, we had church and she went up in front of the whole church and said, I'm naming and claiming this year I'm getting a husband. Brother started slipping out the back of the church. 
Year came and went. She named and claimed. No husband showed up. They believe they can control what's happening. That, that's a different type of Christianity rather than having the patience of the saints and waiting for what God wants to do. Here's some key false doctrines. I won't go into all of these today because we talk about them in the apologetic series, but one of them, the one that we will touch today, is that there's a literal bloodline needed. In other words, in order to be saved, you, or, or, or there's some, you either have to have genealogy back to the Jews or, uh, or they have special privilege that when they're teaching that they don't need Jesus because they're Jews. That's powerful. Another lie that is taught is the eternally burning hell and its impact on the character of God. So they say, listen, when you're lost, you burn forever. You're tortured and, and we get to watch you burn. But you know what they do when they do that? These false prophets, they destroy the image of God's character. Because what kind of God would actually rejoice in watching someone burn forever? You know how many atheists that doctrine has created? Let me tell you something, that is not how God works. The scripture says that the wicked will be ashes under our feet, that they will be destroyed, root and branch. They will be destroyed and wiped out. There's nowhere, the Bible does not teach it. If you don't study it well, you can get verses where you think that's what it's teaching, but the Bible doesn't say that. It says that it's going to burn like Sodom and Gomorrah. There's nowhere on earth still burning in Sodom and Gomorrah. That is now the Dead Sea. The other one is once you're saved, you're always saved. I'll touch back on that later. This is a demonic teaching. This is de devilish. What, you know, listen, if I, and I remember my cousin Sean Taylor, the NFL uh, safety, when he was murdered, and we went to um, his, um, um, his, his funeral, and the Washington Redskins coach, I think his name was Joe Gibbs at the time, was speaking, and he had everybody do the, the, the sinner's prayer that they do. And he said, if you, if you recite this with me and you believe, you're saved. You can't be lost. Because I just said what you said? No transformation of heart or mind? Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. Folk coming into church with a stamp from the nightclub still on their hand, talking about they saved. Misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. And of course, it leads them to be unable to recognize who the Antichrist is. Now, here's where we, it gets interesting. So what's going on in Israel now is going to polarize the world, and you've already seen it polarize college campuses. I mean, the college campuses are, are, are going crazy right now, protesting one side for the other side. People are shocked, and it, unless you understand scripture, it won't make sense. But this is global politics, why American evangelicals are a huge base of support for Israel. So that, you know, this actually goes by Christians United for Israel. This comes from the fact that they believe Israel has to exist. It also is that it's a, it's a, it's a, um, reversion back to an idea that somehow its salvation is tied up in who you are rather than whose you are, right? So who then is Israel? So John Hagee, this is, this is at the, uh, um, uh, near the Wailing Wall. Um, I've been there. It's, it's an amazing experience. Um, and so this is, this is uh, those are Orthodox uh, priests there, and this is John Hagee. Who um, Christians United for Israel? He started it, and I want you to—I want to read for you so you understand what's going on. Why Biden, come almost contrary to many in his own party, would go before our nation two days ago and stand and ask for billions of dollars of aid for Israel? Why would he do that? How does he think he could get that support? How does it even make sense? Now Israel is arguably the only democracy in the region. Uh, there's a lot of reasons you could argue for it, but Israel, there's no oil. There's not. I mean, you know, let's be honest. America likes to go on the places where they're going to get something back out of it, right? Nothing. Why does America have this, 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 this uh, affinity for Israel? With the constant turmoil preventing stability in the Middle East, many are speculating about whether the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. Entire Christian ministries are established to assist in the building of the temple as well. They say, hasten, they say we'll hasten the return of Jesus. For many, a rebuilt temple will signal the start of the final events of Earth's history. However, most of this speculation for a rebuilt temple springs from a single vague reference in 2 Thessalonians 2 dealing with the Antichrist. So I have people who I know, friends, family, went to Israel to help rebuild this temple under the Trump era, uh, Trump administration, because Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They said, that's it. We'll build a temple. Look at this. 
This is the verse that they misconstrue. Let no one deceive you, for the that day will, come, will not come unless the, there is a falling away first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So they say, you've got to rebuild the third temple for the Antichrist to come and sit in it. But they miss it. Every reformer, this is why no longer calling Christians in America, no longer call themselves Protestants, cause problems. Because if you're an evangelical, they could create based on, and I don't have time to get into today, but based on Jesuit teaching, they can now teach that in fact what has to happen is an antichrist. Why? Because they're futurists and they did not want them to believe the antichrist was actually sitting in Rome the whole time. So they pushed it out to the future. They had to create an antichrist. They got to create a temple because they don't understand where the pope sits represents the church. The church is the body of Christ, the temple of Christ. And so the one sitting acting as if he rules the church, who says he does, as I've shown you before, he's the antichrist. And this pope is showing out. He's making no doubt about it, this pope. And so because they believe this false teaching, they want to go build a temple so the Antichrist can come occupy it. You ever heard anything more ridiculous? That's crazy. And that's what they want to do. So they're looking, and that's why this war is so important. Because if they can get total control of the land, they believe they can build this temple and Jesus will return after the Antichrist sits in the temple. But now you miss who the real Antichrist is and false doctrine like the fact that you think you could live forever in hell or heaven, the Bible does not teach that. It teaches that the wages of sin is death. So if you lived forever in hell burning, you actually would never pay the cost of sin. And if you're in heaven now, why does anything else really matter? They will teach the false doctrine of an eternally burning hell, that you go to heaven right away. They will teach the false doctrine that the first day of the week is the day to be served, which is really where all of this is going to go. That's really where it's headed. The idea that we can galvanize around it for peace in the world. Watch what happens, church. And it's all based on misunderstanding of biblical prophecy. And it is not accidental. These are false prophets who are teaching people these lies on purpose. Watch this. This is what they say. Many say that for the Antichrist to sit in the temple, it will need to be rebuilt. Those who support this belief are known as Christian Zionists, and they include such popular writers as Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, who I think is passed now, and John Hagee. Their published book uh, sales exceed 70 million copies, including the popular Left Behind series. Their beliefs are endorsed by some of the largest theological institutions. All right? And of course, the church is called the body of Christ, so when Paul spoke of the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God in 2 Thessalonians, he was not referring to a rebuilt Jewish temple, but rather to the Antichrist power placing himself at the head of the Christian church. And that happened hundreds of years ago and still happening. If you don't get it, you think that this war is what's important. This war is a distraction. Now, it is horrible. Everything happening is... I've been praying for people. I can't imagine what it's like to be a hostage. I can't imagine what it's like to be in a house and bombs are dropping on me. I can't imagine. But spiritually and theologically, it is a distraction from the truth that we are living in the last days and Jesus is about to return. This is what John Hagee says. Are the Jews going to recognize the Messiah as Jesus at the end? This is just a piece of one of his interviews. He says, we are Gentiles. We don't have a covenant. You have a covenant. He's speaking to a Jewish uh, um, reporter. We don't, and that's the only way we get plugged in to have eternal life. Did you see that? We got to plug into the Jews to get eternal life? What happens when the Messiah comes? What happens? He's in charge. Technically, it will be a global theocracy. So then they teach this Antichrist is going to go in there. Jesus is going to come back. I guess he's going to kick him out of the temple, and Jesus is going to take over the temple. I heard Tony Evans of Dallas, Texas say this himself, and Jesus is going to rule the world and make the whole world keep the commandments by force for 1,000 years. A misunderstanding of, of the millennium. You, you see what happens when the false prophets get control? And he says, uh, and we use the term apocalypse here. Is that applied? There's nothing apocalyptic about it. It's a blessing. It's a blessing for Jesus to come back and make you live the way. That's so against God. Here's what he's going on with it. He says this. What do you think are the, are, 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 
think people are imagining when they hear Israel? Is it some sort of biblical idea or is it, it the country where people are rude to each other and live and breathe? What is Israel? What does Israel mean? And this is a Jewish reporter again. To, be, to, be, to the Christian community, let's start with Jerusalem. Watch this. Jerusalem is the city of God. That's in the Bible for, word for word, that Jerusalem is the place where God has caused his name to be written. That's word for word out of the scripture. Jerusalem is the place where Abraham placed the son Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him to prove God that he could not, to, to a God that he could not see and became the father of many nations. Jerusalem is the place where Isaiah and Jeremiah penned the principles of righteousness that became the moral compass for Western civilization. Jerusalem is the place where David captured from the Jebusites 3,000 years ago. Jerusalem is the place that as Christians, Jesus Christ was crucified outside of the city. And this is where the epicenter of the millennial kingdom is going to be, where the Jewish Messiah on the throne, where righteous Jews and righteous Gentiles will be a part of the eternal kingdom. Look at what he says, the last sentence. Jerusalem is the shoreline of eternity. You know what the Bible says about Jerusalem? That there's going to be a new one. There's nowhere that says that the old one has any relevance anymore. Jesus left and said, I leave your house unto you desolate. He wept over Jerusalem, and in AD 70, it wasn't a war, it was a massacre. Uh, Titus, the Roman general, came, annihilated the city of Jerusalem, and ended it never again until 1948 were Jews organized in any way in that land. That's why this is significant prophetically. So look at, look at what it does. Well, the Washington Post, which one of the following contribute to your support for the modern state of Israel? Um, it says, the evangelical attitudes, the Bible says God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Israel is the historic Jewish homeland. Israel is important for fulfilling Bible prophecy. I want you to get this, my fellow Americans. Our tax dollars flow to Israel in part because we believe it is necessary for Jesus to return. It is in many ways a violation of the principles of the separation of church and state, that so much money goes in that direction. Now, I am not against the nation of Israel. Um, you know, I, I've been to Israel, I love Israel, I've enjoyed the time I had there, but this is contrary to what the country was established for. That's why this is prophetically so important for you to understand. Something else is going on. Here's Trump. For many evangelicals, Jerusalem is about prophecy, not politics. They were so happy when he moved to embassy. Half of evangelicals support Israel because they believe it is important for fulfilling end time prophecy. The Washington Post. This is the Left Behind series. As some of you may remember um, the books, millions of books sold. They made movies. They actually made a remake of the movie. And Left Behind basically says, based on the same eschatology of futurism, that what's going to happen is there's going to be a secret rapture. You ever heard of that? In fact, Marvel reenacted it in one of the Avengers movies. At the end of one of the movies, um, Thanos snaps his finger and half the universe disappears. That was them mocking this idea of a future, uh, of a secret rapture. Because then the helicopters start flying all by themselves, people start crashing. That's literally what they say. I've told you this before. American Airlines had a contingency of, 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 of flight attendants who went to the management of, a, of, of American Airlines and said, we want to ask that you never put two Christian pilots in the cockpit at the same time. Because they were afraid they'd be secretly raptured away and there'd be nobody left to fly the plane. And my question, if you're a Christian, ain't you supposed to go with them? Like, you're not going to be left up there by his, you, <laughs> you know, you playing around? What's going on? Left Behind says that there's going to be a secret rapture and there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Why? Because they take the last seven years of the 490-year prophecy, kick it way into the future, and this, what, the, by doing that, they mess everything up because it is in the middle of that week attached to the rest of the prophecy where Jesus dies and it anchors once and for all the prophecy and shows you exactly who Jesus is. By pushing it out, they destroy that. And now they come up with all this false stuff to try and prove it. It is crazy because then they say, you get another shot. This is where it really gets demonic. They say, well, if you miss the secret rapture, hold on, you're gonna live through the great tribulation and at the end of that time, you can be saved. Let me tell you something. The bus that's coming around is not coming back. Every eye will see him, the Bible says. There's no secret about the rapture. There's going to be a rapture, but it's not going to be a secret. Here is it. Look at this. 
Then begins the second stage. While those Christians dwell in heaven for seven good years, the earth is to be racked by ordeals and tribulations from natural disasters to war. Life becomes hell for everyone who did not rise to the upper world, the secret rapture. The Jews specifically will have a harsh passage. True, they will be living in their land in full sovereignty, but they will be unable to accept Jesus into their hearts. Instead, they will prefer to consider one of their own as the Messiah. To our great regret, that figure will be in effect an antichrist. So here's what they believe, that... They're going to set up this Jewish homeland. They're going to protect the Jews. We're going to send all our tax dollars to do it. Then they're going to, there's going to be a secret rapture. The Jews will have their land, but they won't be able to believe in Jesus. So they're going to accept the Antichrist. What kind of crazy theology is this? So what they're teaching is that this is what's needed for the world to come to an end. Let me show you what the Bible actually tells. Well, one, the first question, is Israel needed for Jesus to come or something else? It's not Israel. There's two things the Bible teaches us are necessary for Jesus to return. Matthew 24, 13 says, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness, and then shall the end come. These things that are happening around the world in places where the gospel cannot be preached may be what opens up the door for the gospel to go in. The things I talked about at the beginning of the message. The other one is that God is going to have a people without spot or blemish. Those are the two things that must happen. When those two things are happen. Jesus will return. Um, this is from Hal Lindsey's book, the, great, the, the Late Great Planet Earth. Um, he says, look at it, and look for movements within Israel to make Jerusalem the center of the world and to rebuild their ancient temple in, on, on its old site. Um, and they believe that this is what's going to happen. And this is how bad it gets. It got to the point where now black people think that, you know, you have the, the Hebrew Israelites. You guys have heard of this. <laughs> I joke with Laura about this all the time. There's this movement that now black people say, we are Israel. I mean, I was, I, and every time I go to Miami, I have to deal with these dudes. Every time. And I'm, I'm, I mean, and they tell me, one of them's like, well, we, I said, well, so what tribe are you? A black American dude. I'm from the tribe of Judah. I said, how in the world would you know that? You probably can't tell me your great grandmama name. How you know you're from the tribe of Judah? Every, and then it's crazy because then Puerto Ricans are from another tribe and then the Haitians are from another tribe and Jamaicans are from another tribe. Where do you get this? It was one dude in Chicago who made up this lie. Now Kanye West and all the rappers, it, it's crazy. All these guys have accepted it and they teach it. It was one dude in Ch the south side of Chicago. South side of Chicago always causing problems. Farrakhan lived down there too. Crazy. But here's what the Bible says. I want to leave you with the hope of what actually is important as these wars rage. John 1, 11 says this, and the pastor talked about this in prayer meeting. Now, I love this verse for all of that. Speaking of Jesus, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many, look at this, but as many, how many? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Look at this, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? God. Not flesh. I don't have to try and be of the tribe of Judah. I don't have to figure out a way to become Jewish or Israeli or, 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 or an Israelite. Because what saves me is that I've been born out of the Holy Spirit, of the blood and of the, of the water and of the Spirit. Revelation 22 says it like this. Talking about that, that, that secret rapture. Revelation 22, 10 says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I become quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He is not coming back to take some people and leave everybody else. Everybody's going to get their reward. Some of them are going to lay dead for a thousand years. Satan is going to be in prison for a thousand years. Jesus is not going to be ruling in a temple in Jerusalem during that thousand years. Lucifer will be bound so he can see the full effect of what he's done to mankind. The full effect of his rebellion in heaven. He will be allowed. He will have no one to tempt. That's why he's bound. He's not bound physically. He's bound because he's so used to tricking people and messing with people. And now he has no one to mess with for a thousand years. So what is needed? John 3 and verse 16. I'm going to show you a few verses and we're done. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Whosoever believes. There is a hope in the gospel. 
that says it doesn't matter what family I was born in, what caste I may have been born in, how poor I am, the color of my skin, the level of my education, if I believe, I will be saved. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look at 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear that what we shall be. But we know that, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is speaking to the purity of the church. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. This speaks to the fact that, listen, you're not once saved, always saved. You're going to have to be pure. But it also speaks to the fact that God loved us so much that we have the ability to be adopted into his family. Wherefore, we cry, Abba, Father. Second Peter chapter 2, 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Speaking of the false prophets, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those who were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise, this is what the false prophets do, while they promise them liberty, Let's do what you want, you'll have fun, live up your whole self, be your best self, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. So the world, the false prophets today are telling you, you just be your best you, be who you are, be who you were born to be. And what the, what the scripture is telling you, in fact, they're, they're sending you into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, this is for the Christian who knows better. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, that latter end is worse for them with them than the beginning. It, you can't once save, always save. If you turn back, it's worse. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It's worse once you know this truth to turn from it. 2 Peter 2.22, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to its own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Once you're saved, it's not an always saved. Sanctification is the work of justification on a daily basis. It's you resubmitting your life to him every single day, moment by moment. Romans eleven eighteen. 18, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. Look at this. This is speaking of this bloodline idea. This, they're, they're special and for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. Let me tell you something. The world wants us to believe that we can just do whatever we want. I'm telling you that God has a plan. And the beauty of Christianity, different from every religion in the world, is you can, tr if, you tr if you're willing to submit to God and trust him, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. He will make sure that you're saved. He will take the work upon himself. But we must continue to submit ourselves to him. What is going on in the Middle East, this idea that we can construct, or man can construct a temple, put an antichrist in it, and then that antichrist is going to get kicked out by Jesus. It's simple. He's coming back. Jesus is soon to return, and he's coming for a people who are without spot or blemish. Our work now isn't to build a temple in Israel or, or, or to keep feasts that pointed to the crucifixion. There's a lot of Adventists into that stuff now, too. Same system. Our work is the work of the inward man, the body temple. And the most holy place is the frontal lobe. It is the character. That is the work of our day. And beautifully, wonderfully, it doesn't take money, it doesn't take, it doesn't take riches, it doesn't take education, it takes submission to Christ and allow the blood of Jesus to wash over you. You don't need fancy feasts and festivals. You need devotional time on your knees with him. You need to be in the word, having family worship, building a, a temple in your home, not in Jerusalem. Folk worried about building a temple over there and their family falling apart. Jesus is about to return. And I want to ask you, 
As we close this message, if you want to be ready when Jesus comes, I just want to ask you to stand where you are because he is coming soon. And I'm so glad that he says, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. No reason to fear. He's coming soon. And he will deliver us from this horrible world. All the atrocities we're seeing, Jesus will soon deliver this whole world. And I want to be on his side. That's the only side. There's no black side for me. There's no Palestinian side, no Israel side. The only side I have is I want to be on the side of Jesus. Because he said his kingdom is not of this world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, we live in the day when some think this is the last great war and Israel is in it and this is going to finish all these prophecies. Father God, the last great war of Israel, false prophets caused them to lose to Nebuchadnezzar in a way they never recovered from. Father God, so today in this war, there are many false prophets who want us to think that if we just, if, if Israel gets everything it wants, the world will end. And I'm not picking sides, Lord, but I want the church to know the only side for us is at the foot of the cross. It is at the bleeding side of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to make Jesus our all in all. Help us to follow you whithersoever you lead us. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. Amen. You can remain standing for the closing hymn.